Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Distributed Generation, an Opportunity for Positive Customer Engagement. My name is Denise Salerno, I'm a Marketing Specialist here at West Monroe Partners, and I am joined by Jim McClanahan. I just want to let everyone know that there is a Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Go ahead and feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar and we'll get those answered for you. Um, we'll leave room for a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's webinar. Um, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to Jim McClanahan. Jim, take it away. Thank you. And well, everybody, we appreciate you taking time to participate uh, today. My name is Jim McClanahan. I'm a senior principal with uh, West Monroe's Indian Utility Practice. Uh, actually, have uh, about 29 years now at this point of experience uh, in and around the utility industry. Uh, work with distribution automation, uh, telecommunications scale energy management systems, metering, uh, capacity planning, a little bit of everything around the utility, both uh, uh, with utility and on the, the vendor side. We're also involved in uh, some of the, the unregulated startups uh, that utilities did back in the late 1990s and, and early 2000s. Uh, prior to joining West Monroe, I was at SNC Electric where I was director of uh, smart grid projects. Um, I've got Sean Murphy here with me, uh, who is uh, also with West Monroe and uh, is is very active in this area, and we'll probably be continuing as uh, as we get to some of the questions and stuff at the end. A shot of what we're going to cover today. Uh, we want to discuss the the explosive growth that we're seeing in distributed generation, both today and what's expected to come in the future. Uh, we also want to explore some of the reasons why focusing on the customer experience uh, is so important for the utility. We offer some strategies for actually enhancing the customer experience and. Uh, some of these things can be kind of soft and intangible, but we want to also talk about some ways that you can actually quantify and measure the success uh, of some strategies we're going to discuss. Uh, and we also want to talk about how the utility can remain engaged and relevant to the customer beyond the initial application, beyond the committing, and, and on into the life of the, uh, uh, of the, the solar assets. If you read the, the headlines, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through this, but uh, you, you can't help but see that uh, there's there's tremendous amount of growth going on uh, around solar. And uh, you know, solar in general is doing good, but all of the, the explosive growth in the rooftop solar area uh, is something that's that's very significant, very different uh, than some of the stuff we've seen in the, the past with the utility scale, like the utility scale wind farms, the utility scale farms. Uh, Rob Solar is much more uh, distributed around the, the uh, distribution infrastructure. If you look at uh, what's expected in kind of look in your view mirror 10 years and, and look forward 10 years, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of growth over the last 10 years, uh, but it's really dwarfed when you start looking at what we expect to see over the next, uh, coming 10 years. Estimates are that by the year 2020, we're probably going to have somewhere between 1 and 4 million solar installations, uh, which is a, a pretty big number. The other thing that's interesting about the projections, though, is the, the range uh, between the, the different estimates. So 1 to 4 million is a 4 to 1 ratio. So, so we don't know exactly how many are going to be out there. We don't know exactly what we need to scale to in terms of some of the processes and things like that. Um, but that growth, whatever uh, the growth turns out to be, uh, keeping focused on the customer experience is going to be uh, very important. Uh, uh, growth in rooftop solar is growing uh, fast. We've seen in just 2013, which is the last year that we had numbers for, uh, the price of solar systems dropped around 15%. The number of installations increased around 20%. There are some large utilities that are seeing over a thousand applications a month for uh, uh, of solar uh, um, systems to the, their uh, their network. Um, the interest is, is growing to the extent where now we have a solar uh, installation going live roughly three minutes, which is just a, a I mean it's unbelievably uh, rapid growth. Uh, it has kind of come in fits and starts, and it's kind of uh, there are times when it just takes off and, and booms uh, very quickly. Uh, because of regular issues or technology issues or contractors focusing on a certain area trying to drive growth. Uh, there's some very fundamental changes in the utility industry. Historically, utilities 
uh, were dependent on central generation for the most part uh, because the economies of scale that offered, or, and offered um, it just didn't make sense to build a lot of small power plants. When you could build one big one, it was much cheaper uh, back a century ago when utilities were starting to build the large power plant, operate it, and, and build the distribution system to deliver that. And even through the years, as we've seen some fundamental shifts in the utility industry, like some of the deregulation and stuff that's happened, that model really hasn't fundamentally changed. And even when we saw renewables become important, the, uh, the, the utility scale, wind farms and solar farms, uh, we didn't see a huge shift in, in the change. But with the emergence of distributed generation getting down to the rooftop, we're really seeing a very geographically dispersed generation asset that's appearing across the system in very significant numbers. So take a look back uh, maybe three or so years ago, back, back when I was starting my career. Uh, you know, you look at uh, the early 1980s, uh, a lot of times we didn't have customers, we called them rate payers. And really the shift uh, to thinking of the, the rate payers as customers and treating them like customers for a lot of utilities started happening in the mid-1980s when there were a lot of quality initiatives and things like that going on. A uh, long time, a uh, long running joke was that the customers only thought of the utility uh, one month when they they paid the bill, and every time when the lights went out. That they really just didn't think of us uh, that that often, uh, other than in those contexts. But at the same time, utilities tended to have a fairly good reputation. I was involved in some focus group work uh, with the utility marketing uh, group years ago, and we we had them take different categories of people and lumped together, and actually utility crews tended to get lumped in with uh, the public safety type applications like police, fire, um, and uh, ambulance. So the, the, the patients utilities have uh, is is good, solid. It's it's an asset that utilities should value and should work hard to uh, to maintain. Talk about many customer experience, a positive one. So what is it that takes that makes customers happy? Uh, there's one definitive list, and this these are some ideas that different people have, and and that you come across as uh, as you read about different people's opinions of, of what makes customers happy. But at the end of the day, they really want the utility to be easy to work with. They like to feel like they're informed, like you're giving them the information. Customers like to have choices. Um, and they want to feel like they're listened to. And if you think about what utilities have been doing in the last couple of years, things like keeping the customer informed, a lot of outage management systems now, you can go online, uh, look at a web page on your, your smartphone while the power's out, and have some feel for how, how many customers are out and when service is likely to be restored. Uh, and area of choices, things like time of use rates uh, are actually uh, a start towards offering that. that. Look at this kind of a, uh, uh, I guess, active of a business kind of uh, uh, model. A lot of times there's talk about disruptive technologies, and we've seen disruptive technologies uh, in other areas, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the examples and some of the things that we can learn from that uh, for the utility industry. If you look at, like, the, uh, the Postal Service, uh, they've been around for a long time. Uh, back in the 1970s, 1980s, the overnight packages like FedEx and stuff started uh, not away at portions of their business, and uh, that that hurt them. And then they they thought that was what they had to deal with, and all of a sudden that took off. And email was what they ended up having to compete with next. Uh, so kind of a one-two punch kind of thing, and you know, very difficult for them to to be agile and adapt and come up with a a new business model and uh, a new way of, of interacting with their customers. So if you look at some of the traditional brick and mortar type businesses like bookstores, uh, they've just seen crushing co amount of competition from online competitors like Amazon. Uh, today, if, if a lot of people if they have a book, they go online and they order it. And a lot of them are using e-readers and stuff like that. To, they don't even have a physical book. It doesn't have. They don't have to wait for it to be shipped to them. Uh, that's a, with that kind of fundamental trans, transformation. A brick and mortar bookstore has a really hard time uh, competing in that market. So with all the changes that we're seeing with distributed generation, uh, you know, using some of those proof points, those examples is uh, uh, things that we we need to keep in the back of our mind. Uh, it's really time for utilities to take a close look at how they can ensure a positive customer experience as they move forward. Customers look at new technologies uh, to, to interact with the utility. 
uh, the their expectations have uh, have changed. They've now got uh, the call center. They've got online portals. There may be kiosks. Uh, there's social networking. You may have Twitter accounts or Facebook accounts uh, have to do with the business. Uh, you may have an app out there. So the the how and why of customers interacting and transacting, relating, and experience uh, experiencing uh, interaction with the utility is significantly different than it was back 20 years ago when you got a paper bill in the mail once a month and when the lights went out, you picked up the phone, dialed the number, and, and called it in. Uh, so we live in a much different world and we need to make sure that we adapt our processes uh, to that world. And with things like distributed generation, we're seeing even more drastic changes uh, that we need to adapt towards. A model for how to approach this and uh, look at different different areas of the operations and uh, leverage some of these fundamental shifts to enhance the customer engagement. Uh, this is one of the things that you can look at. Enhancing the customer experience uh, can be things like connecting them in multiple channels, uh, letting them get, use an application, letting them use something online on the web, uh, interactive voice response if they want to, optimizing the channels, things like e-commerce, di digital portals uh, is, are to use Useful, those are important, those are almost expected uh, from customers today. Uh, reducing the cost to serve and the effort to serve, uh, things like self-service uh, is, is something that's out there that people are actually fairly used to now, checking instead of calling up and asking what's the status of something, being able to go online, log on, in, and, and uh, see the status online. And just one-to-one -one marketing, building a strong relationship uh, with the, the customer, um, and you know, capturing data from the, or, or about that customer, that customer's usage, the customer's uh, preferences, um, that's, that's important information that you can use as you tailor the customer experience moving forward. Generation, if you look at how things start, really the first time that the customer is likely to talk with the utility about this uh, is around the enrollment process. And what process, uh, there's, there's a life cycle around a lot of decisions, uh, whether you're buying a, a car, a home, uh, or distribution rooftop solar to put on your house. You kind of start with a, uh, a need and a want. You do research, uh, you evaluate the different options that are out there, you purchase, you enroll, you use it. and then a couple of years from now, you're kind of back to that need, want uh, area. Maybe with something a little bit different. Maybe it's adding more solar to the rooftop. Maybe adding batteries or some kind of energy storage to the uh, the system. Maybe it's signing up for some kind of electric vehicle uh, charging rate. But the cycle that's ongoing that you want to get customers into, engaged in, and uh, and moving around uh, with uh, smoothly and, and kind of with a consistent look, feel, and, and experience for them. For customers, even the enrollment process, uh, they've gone through a very uh, kind of a gutching decision process, if you will, because this is a it's a big decision for them. This is a big investment. Uh, so they may have gone through an energy audit. They've probably looked at whether they have real space available. Uh, they've looked at whether they're making a good long-term investment that it's going to pay back for them. They probably had to look at financing options. Not a lot of people are going to be able to pay for this uh, out of pocket. Uh, they may also have already selected a technology and a supplier or an installer to uh, to put that in. The, the different, different things cause people to look at this. Uh, it's important to kind of get to those also. Uh, some want to do it because it's a green choice. They're, they're concerned about the environment and this is their chance to do something. Some are interested in saving money, uh, reducing their bill. Some want to take advantage of some of the incentives that are floating around out there, uh, you know, tax and other incentives. Some are just Geeks and interested in technologies uh, and want to be the, the early adopters. There's some that are signing up because of sales and marketing efforts that are being made by uh, installers and equipment providers. In the process, the, the utility world can be a little bit limited. You can't really go out and make a recommendation that you ought to use this equipment, you ought to use this contractor, but that's really not that different than some of the programs that utilities have engaged in before. If you look at like, things like energy efficiency and the heat pumps and hot, uh, electric hot water, I know that electric hot water is redundant. Electric water heating, um, you know, the things where even though the utility couldn't push 
specific product or a specific contractor. A lot of times there were alliances with contractors or groups of contractors uh, where they had some kind of seal of approval. Uh, a lot of times there, were, uh, there was information available about the different options uh, of equipment that was certified or, or preferred by the utility. So even though you can't make a hard and fast recommendation, you still have an important role to play in the education uh, of the customer. And another thing to keep in mind is that for the customer, they're a single application. So this is kind of a one chance to get it right for, uh, for the utility. Uh, if the utility is looking at it and saying, well, you know, we're getting 99% of the applications right, or we're only losing a half a percent of the applications that are arriving by paper, or we're only mismatching the checks coming in by mail separate from the applications, we're mismatching those three or percent of the time. Uh, those customers that are experiencing this, that's the only experience they have. So if you lose their application, if you don't apply their check properly to their application, they have to work with you to get that straightened out. That's a pretty negative experience, and that's going to be kind of the defining point of this whole experience for them. So it's really important to drive satisfaction and efficiencies and getting things right uh, down to, to, to very, you know, we can't, we can't be talking about 5% applications getting lost or even 1% applications getting lost. We need it well below that. Uh, and to do that, there's, there's some different approaches. Things uh, is that uh, things that get measured uh, often are the ones that uh, you can actually see improvement. So if you look at the enrollment process and the related activities, uh, there's enrollment, evaluation, the uh, approval agreement, commission and inspection of the uh, equipment and the ongoing operation. Uh, enrollment is the start, but um, K KPIs around the different things, the different things that customers are going to be doing and engage, how they're going to be engaging in the process uh, is important. So uh, with something like a web-based uh, enrollment process, you can make you capture uh, all the enrollment applications, uh, online payment of the primary application fee, can eliminate things like trying to match checks to, uh, uh, to applications. You can also eliminate things like the, the proverbial the checks in the mail. Uh, some of the utilities that we've worked with, they get a check in an envelope and they have no idea whether the check is for somebody wanting to pay their electric bill for an application for a solar interconnect or, or whatever. So uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of chance for error in those types of, of, uh, of process. Um, having the ability to trace the progress of an app application online so that both the utility and the customer know where they are at in this process and how, how, how quickly it's progressing. If there's some kind of holdup, they know what the holdup is, where things set. Um, the time it takes for the utility to, to come that initial screen is important. Uh, if you're going to tell a customer no, no, it's a lot to tell a customer no quickly than to, to drag it out two or three months before you tell them no. When you're putting something on your rooftop and connecting a grid uh, just isn't feasible, and, and here's the reasons why. Uh, a little time to move through this application process is something uh, in terms of KPIs and things to watch uh, that's, that's important and can be measured. So if you look uh, you know, I'm going to step back to, to kind of the, the old-fashioned way. Um, you know, a lot of utilities actually still are using uh, a paper-based process. Some of this is uh, smart PDF files where maybe you can use a computer to type in parts of it, uh, but you're really talking about something where you've got to either print it out and, and write in or you've got to type into some kind of form and then resave it and email it or print it off and send it in. And, you know, think about somebody that is used to using on to do their shopping or something, that's not really the, the look and feel that uh, they want. Instead, they're more used to a, a web-based application uh, where they can log in, they can provide their information, um, and, and handle what it is that they want to do uh, through this, this online uh, experience. So this is something, you know, using an online application, uh, it helps the utility in terms of uh, streamlining the process, having the process very well defined, getting rid of things like lost applications. For customer, though, it comes down to the experience is really what they're used to, something that they're comfortable with, uh, and something that they feel positive about. Also, it's online. All the information related to uh, the application can be captured into a, in a single place, and the customer or the utility can access that at any time. Uh, if you about a customer that maybe they submitted an application a week ago, they had a question about how to submit payment, they, they called up and they talked to somebody and got the details on, on 
who to check out to, where to send it to, and stuff like that. Now, if they call a week later and they're curious about the status of it, they have to repeat the entire story. I, I submitted a paper application two weeks ago, a week ago. I, I got around to writing the check, and I had questions about how to send it to, how, who to send it to, how to, how to handle that process, the address, and things like that. If they have to go through that whole narrative of everything they've had to do, uh, really, in ways, the utility's already failed at that point in terms of customer service. Uh, instead, a, a proactive customer experience would be as soon as the the service representative or whoever takes the call answers it, they should be able to see that once they have the customer's name or their account number, they should be able to tell them, oh, I see you applied two weeks ago, that a week ago you spoke to our other CSRs and had some questions about sending the check and indicated that you were going to send the check. Looking at the status of things, I, I see that the check had not arrived by close of business yesterday. Um, you know, we'll, we'll email you, we'll, we'll drop you an email as quickly as uh, as we do get the check. Uh, that's a Again, a much different experience for the customer. They haven't had to relive history or anything like that. It's like the utility cares about them, knows about them, gets to that one-on-one -on -one individualized marketing that we were talking about earlier before. Before that, Steve, uh, think about having all the applications uh, in this, uh, 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 this online uh, tool that's handling them. Uh, that means that you can have dashboards that are going to help you uh, improve your communications, have more visibility of things. You can improve cycle times. You can reduce the amount of time that it takes to get from one department to another. Um, you got greater visibility just in terms of is it taking me a week or two weeks to process these? Uh, is it taking uh, a certain type of application longer than another type of application? Uh, you've got a central database of all the application information, so you don't have to dig different parts out of it uh, from maybe part of it's in the, the, the uh, customer information system, and another part of it might be in a SIME model somewhere. Um, you know, all that consolidated in a single point has a lot of value. Um, this will help reduce the costs that are related to that, that overall process, and it provides a solid foundation as the volumes grow, especially if we see things where it goes from a trickle to a boom overnight uh, or very quickly. Having these kind of processes in place uh, and automated is going to put you far ahead of the game. So ways the, the whole uh, distributed generation application process that go, uh, that you, the customer go through and that the utility go through, uh, it's kind of like making sausage. You don't necessarily want all the details. You want to you want it transparent. You want them to feel informed, uh, but you really need to separate the internal and the externally focused uh, items. When you talk about uh, to a customer, uh, the status is uh, you know that. Um, hear that, well, your application is under engineering review, that makes sense to them. They kind of understand that. If you tell that, well, we're waiting for a protection coordination study to take place, they really have no idea what that means. So while the utility may need to know it's over in uh, system protection and it's awaiting a coordination study, uh, that's not what you want to tell the customer necessarily. You just want to tell them that uh, the years are looking at it uh, in effect. Uh, this process also where it's, it's scaled. Um, we talked about that one to four ratio of where solar could go uh, by 2020. So having something that can scale down a bit or up a little bit is, is good. Um, but even the one to four uh, right out there in 2020, it's still even at the the low end. It's significantly higher than what we have today. And so there's likely to be a boom sometime in the next seven years or so. And it's good to be ready for that. So a little bit about the utility operations and impact that distributed generation is having on that. Mentioned growth is causing some fundamental shifts uh, in a number of areas around the utility. Uh, these include things like safety. Uh, you've, got, you've got distributed generation out there that could be putting voltages uh, on the system at unexpected times, unexpected places. As uh, impact on the peak load and the load factor. It has an uh, impact on the generation mix. Calculate spinning reserve as we see more and more uh, online uh, distributed generation online. Uh, that could there could be some fundamentally changes fundamental changes around how energy management systems are handled, AGC and those types of things. It can impact power purchasing. It, it definitely impacts distribution planning and engineering. Uh, distribution capacity planning, and then there's, of course, billing implications, too, uh, that you have to deal with. 
at scale, what we've done for century, uh, there's these steps that we go through, the, we plan, we deploy, we manage, and we operate things. Uh, overall, this this is on the utility scale side and the utility owned assets, it's fairly mature. So we've got things like generation planning where we've got robust modeling tools like ProMod. We've got distribution planning and engineering where we've got fairly robust modeling tools like SIME. Um, we know how to do engineering design, develop standards. We, we've got a GIS system. We've got asset management in place. Uh, we've got forecasting unit commitment. With the energy management system and AGC and distribution SCADA um, and, and distribution automation, we've, we've got all that down. That's fairly mature at this point. If you have a parallel to that, that uh, is more around the distributed assets and the customer owned assets, and we're not as far along on that. Uh, in fact, it's almost kind of like an hourglass shape. If you look at uh, incentives and programs, actually utilities have a fair amount of experience. Uh, I mean, we've been doing that with energy efficiency and stuff for uh, for decades now. And if you look at the the other end of the express, uh, the spectrum down around the operations, uh, the uh, the DERMS um, energy resource management system, that's a key component. If if I um, distribute like energy storage systems or, or other um, devices from manufacturers, uh, have a DERMS to make it operate and play well with the grid. So the vendors have really been driving development of the DERMS uh, aggressively, and we're really not in too bad a shape, even though it's not necessarily mature in terms of years. Uh, there has been a lot of effort going into that, a lot of effort continuing to go into it. It's the middle area uh, where we've got some gaps. We kind of skinny down in the, the hourglass model. Things around uh, distributed ener uh, energy uh, resources and distributed generation uh, enrollment, making the utility aware of it, the screening and the approval process they go through, uh, any asset tracking that we need to do. So a lot of utilities, it's very difficult for them to say, these are the homes that we have solar on. Uh, a lot of times there's not one definitive list that, that covers some of this stuff. And um, you know, looking at things like distributed generation, the, the performance trends and analysis, um, there's a lot of value in that. Uh, nobody's really dug into that middle part of this uh, that aggressively. This is still very, uh, it's an area that's that's emerging and uh, very dynamic right now. Yeah. This is a way of uh, viewing this. Uh, there's a number of systems that are out there, and uh, in some way we need to, to glue them all together. And maybe something like an, an enterprise services bus, um, but at the same time, we just bring systems together. Part of this is about bringing the right systems together. So we need to look at the gaps or any of the project uh, process discontinuities, uh, any of the areas that aren't going to scale well, and address those as we bring all this stuff together and, and kind of glue it together into something cohesive. So application tool, uh, it, it facilitates obviously the customer experience. Um, but it is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, capable of giving us some information around the, the KPIs. And customers aren't the only ones who have become used to a different way of doing things, uh, using Amazon and stuff like that. A lot of the employees and management uh, within the utility uh, have a very different uh, mindset and, and uh, different set of expectations in terms of uh, information. A once a month report is more the exception than a rule. Uh, a lot of it's for people that are managing stuff that really has the view day to day. So being able to look at this in real time, being able to see that yesterday we completed so many process, uh, so many applications that uh, currently the average application that we've got in house has been and is pending approval uh, is it's 4.5 days old. That kind of information, knowing that every morning, I mean, really a lot of the people that are involved in matching the uh, the application process and helping customers get distributed generation on the site. Uh, on the system, They're, they are looking at those kind of metrics uh, on a daily basis when they have automated systems. But with doing things the manual way, uh, it's very difficult to keep current on status. It's, uh, setting priorities is difficult when it's done by paper. Measuring the KPIs uh, is difficult. Spreadsheets just don't work and they don't scale. Uh, we also are working with uh, some utilities, trying to help them improve their processes where uh, they do a lot of print, print off uh, a PDF file, fill in parts of it, um, and then they'll scan it back in and store it. Then somebody else may print it off, 
and fill in another part of it. That part scans it and uploads and sends it back in. Um, there's really no automation in that process, and it's certainly not going to scale. So a process on the utility side, it's, it's going to help the utility, but it's also almost always going to lead to a better experience for the customer also. Once it's complete, it's easy to think. We kind of, if you've got traditional thinking, uh, or the, the mode of thinking in mind, uh, job's done. We, we have the application, we processed it, we approved it, we got the agreement signed, uh, it's online, and, and uh, things are up and running. But there are ways that the utility can continue to stay involved and make sure that they're viewed as being more than just another bill that the customer gets every month. Uh, the utility can help customers quantify the benefits they're seeing each month. Customers love to brag about saving money. So if you can tell them you saved on average $15 last month because you had this solar installation, or you saved $120 last year, or $200 last year, or the system is going to pay for itself uh, in an average of five and a half years or seven and a half years, those are the kind of things that customers like to hear, like to know, and appreciate being uh, informed and, and told about. Um, there's also some basic diagnostics that you can perform with that a little bit later, uh, but you've got a lot of information in terms of the hourly, uh, the data, the how much, you know, what the what load is, uh, what the load curve would normally look like for the house, what it actually is, and there's things that you can pick out of that. Like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit. Um, there's also uh, other opportunities that for the utility to uh, to stay involved, and this just shows that the the utility that they're they're trying to help. Uh, it can help with word of mouth awareness out in the neighborhoods and among friends and neighbors. Uh, the distributed generation that the utility is uh, is trying to push this, is helping this, is supporting of this. Uh, basically, too, at the end of the day, you want to close that loop and gather information from the customers about what they experienced, how they felt about it, and little ways to improve it. And that uh, you can do basic diagnostics, and, and uh, here's an example. A production curve for solar installation uh, that is indicating some problems. On the left-hand side is the curve of what the utility would expect a certain installation to be uh, uh, be doing. On the right-hand side is actual curve uh, of that that resource, and this is actually uh, a real-world example of uh, where some information was available. And uh, you see a pretty significant difference uh, between the predicted and actual behavior. Now, predictive behavior, you've got a lot of data points about it. You've got historic performance from the customer's own system. You've got information about the performance of other similar systems that are on the network. So when something looks odd, you've got a couple of different things you can compare to. Uh, predict that some, or uh, uh, make analysis and, and determining that something could be wrong, letting the customer know about that uh, is going to help strengthen the relationship. In this case, uh, what was occurring was shadowing of the solar panels. Uh, the customer was able to do some tree trimming, and they were able to move over and get the uh, the expected uh, pertin curve out of their system. Uh, if the you know, if this had not been looked at using an automated system that was digging through the data and churning through it and trying to see how things really were performing, uh, I could have sat out there forever for the life of the equipment, uh, performing suboptimally, reducing the the return on investment that the customer is seeing. Um, and when we make predictions about how solar is going to behave, a lot of times we don't necessarily take into account some of the things like shadowing and stuff. So even in some of the predictive models that may be out there, um, it may impact our modeling of that system uh, if that system's not not adhering to what we think the model should look like. A customer effort index. And I talked earlier about uh, some of the the, the service stuff can be kind of soft and squishy and warm and fuzzy type of stuff, uh, not necessarily uh, measurable. Uh, but it's actually been, in a lot of the, the looking at things, there's a hierarchy of customer needs that's kind of like uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy needs. Um, and and it really helps create customer loyalty, and if it's not there, uh, is going to have a negative customer experience. It's just how easy are you to work with? Uh, if you easy to work with, if things seem to go smoothly, 
uh, then they build loyalty and satisfaction. If you're difficult to work with or if customers feel like they've had to invest too much time or they've gone through the same thing over and over again, even if at the end of the day they get something that they're happy with, uh, if they're unhappy with that process, unhappy with the amount of effort they had to put into it, that can lead to dissatisfaction uh, on the part of the customer. One of the nice things about the Customer uh, Effort Index, the CEI, is that it's something that's uh, very quantifiable. These are some uh, fairly generic examples, but uh, that's how you can assess the different uh, areas and, and gather information um, about how to deliver uh, the, the type of customer experience that you're delivering, as well as some insights. Uh, this is stuff that can be benchmarked. You can compare against other uh, utilities. You can compare it against other industries. So, so it helps you make sure that you're uh, adopting best practices and that you're in line with uh, with what customers want. I also uh, this is not something that you know, just a few utilities is looking at or, or that we're just looking at. Actually, the Department of Energy, um, as part of the SunShot program, uh, they've uh, they've got an initiative going on. Uh, to, look, to take a look at the things that could impede customers from uh, applying for and deploying distributed generation uh, resources. Uh, this is really a, a project that's currently going on where we're, we're involved and we're helping gather information and analyze that information. Uh, if you are interested in participating, uh, we really would, uh, would love to have more people participate in the survey. Uh, links are there. If you want to drop me an email, I can, can also send you the links. But this, is, uh, this involves both uh, the utilities and the solar stakeholders uh, trying to get a feel for what was the process like, how are different utilities approaching things, what are the pain points, what are the choke points around this, how long does it take, uh, is it something that's going to scale, is, is it something where a lot of them are using spreadsheets and uh, you know they could be using databases, uh, are they using paper, and they could be using an online application form. Uh, so a lot of a lot of interest, and some of the utilities that are involved in in this initiative uh, with the DE uh, will be participating in this and trying to look at how we can reduce that uh, kind of that barrier to entry, if you will, uh, for getting rooftop solar. And again, if if any of you are interested in participating in the the surveys or um, this program, drop me an email, and I'd be happy to uh, to get you some information. So process and tool can also be leveraged moving forward. Uh, that a customer decides not to do this, that uh, for some reason they look at it, uh, may talk to the utility a little bit, but then they decide not to do it. There's still things that um, that you can do. You know that uh, uh, they're an early adopter and that they did take a, at least a proactive look at this. They did make a conscious decision not to do it. Uh, you're proactive in the communications going forward. Um, can Try and understand their decision, and that provides feedback both to the utility, to the, the solar industry that can be useful. Was it because of the aesthetics of the installation? Was it cost-based? Was it because of the complexity? Um, by knowing those, again, those are barriers to entry that if we know what is what is causing people not to go down this path, we can back before back into the process and help address those issues going forward. Um, the, the industry is also uh, dynamic. So while we've got a a, we, we look at building a process and, and tools and systems around distributed generation today. You know, if we take a look back five years, we may have been talking more about wind instead of solar. If we look uh, five years forward, we may be talking about for solar uh, and, and even more solar. We may be talking about the need to do something around uh, knowing where electric vehicles are and where charging stations and in grass are. We may be looking at uh, storage, uh, energy storage, batteries may see some kind of phenomenal leap in terms of ter uh, their capabilities or lowering of their prices. Um, so, uh, you know, all the dynamics in the market, knowing about your, your customers, uh, there's a lot of companies that spend a lot of money gathering information to get some insight about their customers. So, these customers that are applying, whether they wind up going through the complete application process or not, not, you learn some things about them. It's important to capture that uh, and try and use that in a, a positive way for them. Um, about what does the, the future hold? Uh, we're probably likely to see a continuing reduction in cost and improvements in efficiency and getting easier and easier to, uh, to install. There are real-time communications as a 
set point and operating parameters to the inverters uh, being discussed today. It's already being done, some, being done by some utilities uh, in Europe. It really hasn't caught on in the United States, but uh, with some of the challenges and issues that uh, utilities are seeing when they bring inverters on with a fixed set point, like uh, forcing them to provide unity power factor, um, you know, sometimes that can cause unexpected uh, increases in quality. So being able to push out a set point that we want you to operate at some power factor other than unity for you know this afternoon or something uh, could have value. Communities with the inverter and communications out to the customer site uh, may also spur utilities to being more willing to allow uh, the distributed generate sources to actually feed back in the grid. A lot of times today, rooftop solar is only there to offset the consumption on the premise itself. But um, you know, if they've got more solar than they can use, feeding it back into the, the grid, if you've got some control, some visibility of that, uh, that becomes a lot more palatable for, uh, for utilities. Um, we're also very likely to see integration of storage in, as part of a more comprehensive solution. Um, you know, if you look at the, the production curves for the solar, it lines up with the, the peak, but it's still not per perfect. Um, and solar, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Integrated storage could make a, a big difference there. Also, see big changes in the energy storage area. We could uh, people start looking at standalone energy storage. Maybe I want to charge my batteries with off-peak energy that I buy at two o'clock in the morning, really cheap. Where a utility's got a base load generator and they're they're begging for load uh, for that base load generator. And if I buy uh, a set of batteries, I can charge them at two o'clock in the morning, and that's a lot cheaper way to charge them than buying a set of solar uh, cells and charging them in the afternoon. So we may see some dynamics like that depending on what happens uh, uh, in storage. And at the end, of the day, there's probably some things that we aren't even thinking of. Uh, if you look back at the internet back two years ago as it was emerging, I mean, there's a lot of things that have happened that. Uh, Nobody ever guessed. If you look back at things like cell telephones and, and where that's evolved with the iPhones and other types of devices like that, I mean, nobody ever would have invented that with, uh, I remember I was excited to get my first flip phone, you know, and, and get rid of the, the big brick. So uh, things really can take unexpected paths sometimes. Um, I had a crystal ball and I could get an answer to one question, just, and this is just my, kind of my personal opinion, personal curiosity. Uh, I guess one thing I really uh, wonder is what is going to happen in energy storage in terms of cost, availability, and the, the penetration uh, of that technology over the next decade or two? Because I think that's going to have some pretty significant impacts on the directions the, the industry takes. Some of the, the key points, um, the growth in top solar and, and uh, distributed generation in general is really forcing utilities uh, to, to interact with the customers. So if you got to interact with the customers, Let's spend a little bit of extra effort and make sure that it yields a positive customer experience. And there can be value in that for both the utility and the customer. Um, while utilities are handling a lot of applications every week, every month, every year, um, some utilities are handling over a thousand a month. Um, most utilities are going to make, or most customers are going to make one or two applications uh, to the utility. For that customer to have a positive experience, I mean that, that particular application has to be processed smoothly, cleanly, efficiently. So this isn't a matter of percentages where if you can get 95% good, that's good enough. I mean, this is something where you need 99.9% uh, type numbers in terms of making sure applications aren't lost, making sure that payments line up with applications and things like that. Have a certain way uh, they become comfortable interacting with customers and certain expectations around the look and feel of how they deal with that. And uh, it's actually, Probably to the, the utilities benefit to try and line up with that uh, instead of trying to force customers to to do something uh, in in the fashion way or in a way that they aren't comfortable with. So there are some very measurable metrics that you can gather so that you can trend things. The, the KPIs around the time uh, that things are taking, uh, um, also the uh, the customer effort index that we talked about earlier. And the ability uh, the ability to scale is really critical. <clears throat> And you know, one of the things I like to talk about is success-based scaling. So uh, it's if you have to invest a huge amount of money up front in processes and systems, uh, that's, that can be painful. If you don't invest until you see this tidal wave that's overtaking you, uh, that can be painful too because you've waited too long. Having something that's success-based where you make investments, 
the scale with how your your need to use those investments. Uh, this is kind of except that uh, uh, in the capital industry gets talked about uh, a fair amount with some of the different technologies. But having a success base, so like with the cloud-based tools, software as a service, um, those really help with the scalability. At the low end, if you're just handling a couple applications a month now, you can still implement kind of tools economically, effectively. Uh, and if you go from a, uh, handling a dozen applications a month to handling 100, that online tool can, uh, can scale with you. And it may happen very quickly and with very little uh, advance notice. Um, and final point, and I think we all know it, is that the, the future is really difficult to predict. And the only thing we know with any degree of certainty is that things are not going to stay uh, the same. So then, um, appreciate these attendance, and now we'll open it up to, uh, to questions if you have any. Great, thanks, Jim. Um, we did have several questions come through, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, one, it's a two-part question. From a software vendor perspective, are these solutions typically sold separately or bundled? And the second part, what kind of insights could such a solution offer to distribution planning? Uh, I would say, there's, well, there's a number of different solutions out there. If you look at something that's a class, uh, you probably want to pick. Uh, you probably gonna use a single uh, solution. If you look at like uh, there, there's things like Sime that's a very mature, robust tool for doing the the distribution uh, analysis. Um, so use that. But there aren't necessarily tools that are uh, or a lot of tools that are out there for, for taking the online application. Uh, there's only two or three tools that are really uh, debate and, and robust in there. So you're probably going to have to pick a couple of different tools to get the best category. Um, but having things like the, the slide I showed with the enterprise service bus that lets you glue those things together uh, is, is one of the keys to success. In terms of what this can provide to distribution planning, um, you know, being to, to take and some of that process around the, the checklist, make sure that the distribution planning people uh, have the information they need. They know which feeder it's on, which station it's coming out of, which transformer it's on. Um, you know, helpful. Uh, there are some some efforts underway to automate parts of the modeling, whereby uh, when you do the application, you could do some kind of quick green or something that's kind of like a uh, a SIME light, if you will, where you've got some kind of tool that, that just quickly tells you, this looks okay, this doesn't look okay, or this one's on the, uh, on the edge and needs a closer look. Um, automating that process of being able to feed stuff into SIME uh, would, would also just being able to uh, have smooth transfer if, some, if one distribution engineer looks at it as well, the customer would need to do this, then this, uh, we'd be able to put this on the system. If three months from now the customer comes back and says, "I did these things, and I want to, I want to uh, place system or I want to place the distributed generation resource on the system," being able to look back and see, okay, that is really what we told them, and they've really addressed those issues. Uh, instead of having to re, you know, at that, that point you don't want to be redoing the study. So just that, having that single database and the continuity and the availability of the information uh, is one area of of some value. Uh, I don't know if you've got some other ideas on that, Sean. Okay. Terrific, thank you. Um, another question, Jim. What online payment system would you recommend for utilities to set up in order for customers to be able to pay for the interconnection application online? I think I can take that one. This is Sean. Um, the exact question is, is it really, de it depends. There are um, several factors you have to consider when looking at an online payment system, starting with the policies. There may be security requirements or other areas you need to look at. And items like what type of online payment do you want to support? Do you just want to take credit card or debit card, or do you want to take e-checks, uh, PayPal, Bitcoin even? Um, and that will you know, steer you towards a subset of the vendors. And then we're going to have slightly different fee structures. You'll want to take a look and, and, and just run the numbers on what you're comfortable with, depending on your volume. So if you want him an email, he can connect me. I'd be happy to talk through that in more detail with you. And what we're seeing is that a lot of times this is not a decision that's made in isolation. When they look at e-payment, a lot of utilities have initiatives that are going on uh, looking at what they want to do company-wide. So a lot of times it's not so much picking a solution that will help with the generation itself as picking the right one for uh, the utility as a whole and then fitting it into the distributed generation process. 
Uh, another question that came through, um, are you aware of any utilities that are actively deploying distributed generation tracking and analysis? The, the, the thing, knowing where assets are, um, what type of equipment is there, uh, yes, that, I mean, that's definitely being done. Uh, a lot of uh, there's utilities that are gathering data and um, putting it into tool like Pi Historian. Uh, there's some basic analysis of that going on, but today it more comes down to somebody deciding to take a look at something like the load curves that I showed earlier with the anomaly. Uh, really, was somebody deciding to take a look at something and and pulling up the data that's that captured is easily available uh, and and. And noticing that there seems to be a disconnect and so some kind of uh, automated system or some kind of analytics uh, making those decisions or catching those kind of things. So um, this is there, it's being captured, it's available, it's being annually analyzed today. Um, we've not seen a lot of uh, automation in that area yet, and we haven't seen, I, I would expect to see the application of analytics in that um, over the next few years. All right, question, Jim. What are benefits to having a central location for customer cited DG asset data at the utility? If I look at things, um, a lot of times there may be a SharePoint site, there may be a, a shared drive where things are kept. There could be multiple documents that are scanned. A lot of this, like I mentioned earlier, they may print it off, fill in part of a form, scan that, uh, upload it, then somebody else downloads it, prints it, fills in another part of the form, scans it, uploads it. Uh, so it can save a lot of uh, a lot of work by having everything in one central location and having digital copies of that. Uh, it gives you a lot more credibility uh, if if uh, somebody claims to have a that you've lost an application that, that they made an application and and uh, they never heard back from you. you know, having tracks uh, that show who who is logged on, when they logged on, and stuff like that can be useful. Um, it's probably a number that I'm. Missing in there, but you know, we, we just see overall uh, it makes things much more efficient, and it also I, I think the big thing it does is making things more scalable. Today, uh, there's a lot of utilities where if you look at the list of all distributed generation sites that they have on their system, it's a spreadsheet with a few hundred entries. Um, if it gets to a few thousand entries, or if they start having to process a hundred applications a month. You know, that's not going to scale, and it's more centralized and integrated solutions. No. And some of that integration, you mentioned the enterprise service bus early, so it may not, all the data may not necessarily be in one big database or on one single computer. It may be spread across a couple of systems, but the idea is to make it seamless and put together the right information. If you're a distribution engineer, you may pull stuff out of the SIM model, out of the CIS, the application, and bring it together in a certain view for that person. We're in billing, uh, you know, maybe the CIS and, and the, the application, and you pull together a different view for that person. So it lets you customize and tailor those views with bits and pieces of information that could be spread potentially across multiple systems. Thanks, Jim. Another question. Do you think the utilities are changing their business model so that independent operators will run the distribution system? In other words, do utilities want to become Solar City? No, don't see that. I think utilities are struggling with exactly how they are deal with parts of this and exactly what they want to look like and what parts they want to take on. Um, if you look back, uh, you know, there's kind of a, a, a historic basis for, for the approach likely to take. Uh, if you look at, like, the energy service companies, ESCOs, that were formed uh, back in the late 90s, you know, a lot of utilities they were very interested in energy efficiency. There were a lot of incentives around energy efficiency, uh, but there were limitations on what a utility could do. So utilities tended to start unregulated subsidiaries to go after kind of those more entrepreneurial opportunities uh, and handle them outside the regulated structure of the core utility itself. So I would not be surprised to see some utilities and, and utility holding companies take that direction and start uh, an unregulated entity and maybe go aggressive after uh, portions of the solar deployment market, uh, whether it's uh, you know turnkey installation or possibly even ownership of solar assets on, on rooftops. Uh, but I don't think the core utility itself uh, will go there. I, I, I just I don't don't see it's really pointing in that direction. Thanks, Jim. 
And folks, we have uh, time for a couple more questions, but Jim's contact info is there on that last slide, so feel free to send him an email with any of your questions. Um, so another one that came through, Jim, do you have a sense that customers see solar as a consumer electronics type system that will have upgrades, just like someone would invest in new Wi-Fi, a new Wi-Fi modem every two years? Or do they see it as a house renovation that is done once in a while and stays the same? I think from what, what I've seen working with a couple of different utilities, I think the, the solar cells, they go up on the roof. Nobody wants to be going up on that roof every two years, and nobody wants to be swapping out that really heavy stuff that you had to get up there with a crane or something every two years. So I don't think that part is going to see dynamic over. And also just the payback, that stuff needs to last uh, a decade or two decades without being changed out. Uh, if you look at like the inverters, some of the heavy duty parts of the inverter, uh, those are fairly expensive and, and heavy and difficult to move around. So you really don't want to be replacing them that often either. If you look at the intelligence though and the control systems and the capabilities, uh, I do see the grades in terms of the capabilities and the functionality. Um, you know, I talked earlier about communications, uh, probably utility communicating with the inverter and being able to provide real-time set points for power factor, voltage, or stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I think there will be some changes uh, to that, the, the capabilities around the intelligence, the, the software that runs the system. Uh, there may be a little bit of change in some of the stuff that's not a roof, but um, you know, the heavy iron type of stuff. Uh, and, and the, the cells themselves up on the roof. I think people are viewing that more as something that needs to have a 15 to 20 year life. Uh, but in terms of the capability, being able, you know, the capabilities of the inverter, maybe being able to look at the, the status of things on the web, uh, those are the kinds of features and functionalities that I think will, will see more something like consumer electronics where you see uh, updates to the application and the new features in the application um, on a regular basis. Great. And um, someone asked, in this Nest and smart things driven smart home market, do you think some of the distributed generation process actually end up behind the meter at the inverter or smart gateway? Uh, I think that, that you know, this is, uh, there's an opportunity here uh, uh, how this plays out, out a couple of different ways. But I talked about the UT uh, communicating with the inverter, maybe instead of that, uh, you see something like uh, Nest or SmartThings be an aggregator or be used as an aggregator uh, of homes with solar capability and uh, the utility contacting them and dealing with it more like a, a, a single contact with a large resource instead of having to have, uh, for utility, maybe it's easier to have uh, one, one aggregator that there's only one signal to uh, instead of uh, 5,000 end devices. And that's, that's a decision I think different utilities are going to have to make uh, uh, into kind of the agility and the regulatory environment and stuff like that. There are things uh, that would probably make that a little easier at this point for those third-party uh, devices and applications to, to provide that type of service than for the utility to, uh, to, to get behind the meter and start providing that. But I do, there, there's value there. In any place there's value, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's, I think this is one of those areas where we're likely to see some really creative ideas come out that uh, we probably haven't, haven't even thought of yet or aren't talking much about today. So I do think that uh, some things will happen. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the utility role in that will be. Um, I think utilities are going to tend to want to see it aggregated and kind of made clean for them uh, to handle. Uh, they could be more involved in that, uh, but I really think there's going to be some third-party creativity come to the table there. Thanks, thanks uh, again for a great webinar, and thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, Jim's contact information is there. Uh, you can also visit our website at westmonroepartners.com and go ahead and follow our ENU team on Twitter, at WMP Utilities, um, for all the latest news and thought leadership around the ENU industry. And uh, for those of you that will be at Distributech next week in sunny San Diego, California, Go ahead and visit us at booth number 620. Um, come say hello to everyone and uh, hear what our team has to say. Thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.